The Reverend Barry W. Lynn, for nearly a quarter of a century, ran Americans United for separation of church and state. And uh, besides being an attorney, a member of the Supreme Court bar, he is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. And it's great to see you. Nice to be back. Uh, I have to do something to you. What? How, how old is your oldest grandchild? Four. All right. I'm going to I'm going to do this now. And then in five years, we'll play it for your grandchild. OK, I'm doing this to everybody who has. Right, OK, this just makes me so happy. OK, uh, you know, the International House of Pancakes. Yes. OK, I want you to spell IHOP and then add Ness at the end of it. I H O P S. <laughs> Listen, okay. I heard you. I heard you do this already. Oh, so okay. I knew what I was ready for. Okay. But I want to tell you something. You know, last week I did a session teaching at the uh, Kurt Vonnegut Museum and Library, and yes. the first thing I said was that everything that people try to censor is not about sex. But then I made a reference to the subject that I I read from my book about on one of your uh, office hours and hours. This was when they took a vote on whether the commissioners took a vote on whether Michelangelo's famous statue of David was or was not pornographic by a narrow vote. They voted that it was not pornographic. And I said to these students last week, but you still could see a penis. And I, oh, can I say that? So, so you can trick people into saying it, or you could just say, mm -hmm. what's the male organ that most fraternity brothers believe is the most important thing they have? <laughs> and then people would just go, penis? Right. <laughs> Wait, hey, I, I indulge me because it's hot. My air condition. It's August. Um, and then we'll talk about okay. whatever you want to talk about. I on TikTok, I saw this. I'm repeating myself, but it just make it just. There's something really beautiful about like a seven year old grandson tricking the grandfather into saying the word penis. And there's this like there's this kabuki act where. The grandfather has to pretend he's mad that he got tricked into saying <laughs> penis like you like, oh, you, you got it just makes me. I don't know. It's something about civil, something about civility where we we pretend to be offended because we're telling our grandchild there's a time and a place for this. And you got me. And I don't know. There was something beautiful about it. I, I can't explain it. it. It it's what separates us from uh, the animals, and by that I mean the Republican Party. Yeah. Okay. Why do you watch TikTok? I uh, because I can't sleep. And mm -hmm. have you tried it? Yeah, my son, who's you know works for a, a big uh, computer company, but he said never sign up for TikTok. If you if you want to test it out, just don't give them any information because they'll use it. You'll end up regretting it. Right. I, I watch it on YouTube for some reason. On YouTube. I, somehow it's on YouTube. Yeah. They, oh. I think I think Trump wanted TikTok to be bought by Michael. An American Trump. company. Right. Yeah. right. But it's 30 seconds and it's great it's your you know it's perfect for insomnia and your attention span and you keep swiping <laughs> this one will be good and like every yeah. third one is good and they do these amazing things like a guy in india on the streets making this amazing omelet but it's like asmr some of this stuff is just i find it uh relaxing and then anyway uh but the political stuff on it is i it, i haven't seen any of the political stuff Oh, Is there political know. stuff on oh, it? Oh, no. Uh, a lot of right wing political stuff. Really? Yeah. I, I'm surprised oh, yeah, that absolutely. right wingers yeah. have an attention span longer than uh, 20 seconds. seconds. <laughs> yeah. I figure five. 
So the right wing is taking TikTok. Cat videos. I'm a yeah, I don't like them. You don't like cat videos? No. Nope. I'm so allergic to cats that I, I can't even look at a picture of them without sneezing. Cats and dogs interacting. I can watch it. And Don Rickles. I can watch it. If I Don can't. Rickles. Please. Did you like Don Rickles? Yes, I did. I like Buddy Hackett more. I disagree with you, but you never saw the Buddy Hackett. What am I? Why am I alone on New Year's Eve? Bit. I mean, it, it it's memorable. I saw it when I was probably six or seven years old on New <laughs> Year's Eve on television. But it was hilarious. Rickles is a miracle. Hmm? Rickles is a miracle. It's like. You listen to George Carlin, he gets better with time. Bill Hicks gets better with time. Yeah. Rickles on Carson gets better with time. He goes, he comes out with no, no material whatsoever. And you t you're, you're a minister. It, it's like the book of Genesis. He, he let, he, there was no comedy. And then he said, let there be comedy. <laughs> It was comedy. I mean, he just looks around yep. and touches something out of out of just the ether. He Rickles just is able to pull it out. of Anyway, I'm rambling. It's hot. That's OK. What is on your mind, sir? I have some questions I wanted to ask. you. Well, before. I would. Um, uh, and we're not getting your wife tonight. Is that no, correct? No, you're not. Mm -hmm. But you see, I'm sitting in another room mm -hmm. now. Here's what I thought. I, I was listening to your discussion about Nina Turner, and I, I too, I wish she had won. And I also hope that in the event that this uh, so-called bipartisan infrastructure bill comes up, that AOC and the other members of the squad and the truly progressive Democrats who are not members of the squad will vote against this bill and take it down unless they get not just an agreement that there will be a vote on the three and a half trillion dollar human infrastructure bill, but that they will get a successful vote on an important voting rights bill. If they don't get those, one of those two things, then they should just vote no and let the whole thing collapse. Isn't Schumer saying that, that the voting rights bill will be a separate bill, but not linked to infrastructure? Is that yeah, no, no, it's a separate it will be a separate bill. But so there's a John Lewis bill and then there's what was H.R. 1 that passed in the House. I don't care what you call it. I do care that it makes an effort to overturn all of these horrendous uh, voting restricting bills that are being passed all over the country. Right. And, and Manchin the other day apparently said he'd be open to considering, you know, the, uh, the the most serious voting bill, they made a few changes. They ought to make a few changes. If that's what's going to take to get his vote, Kristen Cinema, I don't know what it will take to get her vote, but uh, she should just be ashamed of herself. And frankly, I saw a poll a few days ago that 75 percent of Democrats in Arizona want her to be primaried. That's a good sign. That's a very good sign because and I don't see her becoming a Republican because, frankly, in Arizona, of all places and maybe others, I don't see an openly bisexual woman being becoming the standard bearer for the Republican Party in that election. I just well, don't see she it. is bipartisan. Yeah, she is bipartisan. bipartisan. She's bilateral, too, I think. The bicameral. Yeah, the bye bye. Yeah, bye bye. The uh, <laughs> Professor Ben Burgess has a piece in Jacobin calling bipartisanship BS. But historically, nothing except for I think Johnson and the civil rights bills. But historically, things were never accomplished through bipartisanship. Right, the New Deal was not bipartisan. Right. No, it wasn't. The Fifteenth Amendment. The 13th Amendment, this was all done along party lines. It was people saying, we have the power now, let's use it. 
That is correct. We may not have it in a year. Let's use it now. That's right. So I don't see Biden succeeding uh, trying to reach across the aisle. The only good thing bipartisanship has gotten us is another case of COVID for Lindsey Graham. <laughs> that's the only thing good that's come from bipartisanship. Joe Manchin's yacht. What are they going to do about voting? How bad is Texas? Greg Abbott, the governor of Texas, has called a new special session of right. the Texas legislature. He wants to pass voter suppression laws. Um, just to play the heel here, are these voting suppression laws that bad i've i've heard people say i've heard people say granted they're racist republicans writing for the national review <laughs> that some of these laws are no different than the kind of laws they have in europe like you know estonia <laughs> Lithuania, yeah, right. Poland, yeah. and hungary <laughs> oh. and russia i mean and, um, no it, they are this bad. They they will clearly cause difficulties, particularly in poor areas in places like Texas, to vote. But the argument that they're not that bad is often coupled with the argument: the more difficult you make it for people to vote, the more of a backlash there will be, and people will all of a sudden come out of the woodwork and start to vote again, and that will just nullify all the bad things that these bills create. Now, I, I put that in the BS category. I do not believe that for one second. In Georgia, that kind of happened in a way, almost happened. Well, the lines, I mean, you saw. Correct. But but I think that that was an anomaly. I think it, it had all the right elements. You had this was going to make all the difference about who would control the Senate. They had two really flawed Republicans who, even if you kind of liked their policies, you basically knew both of them were crooks. And I don't think that that's going to be replicated in most of the elections coming and up you in have 2022. Stacey, and you have Stacey Abrams. I mean, you can't. Of course separate nope. Warnock's victory uh, and Ossoff's victory from Stacey Abrams, who had her, she had her governorship stolen from her by Kemp, yep. incontrovertible evidence. Uh, she really didn't deliver a concession speech. No, nope. She lost and she fought. We don't, have, um, it's interesting about fighting. So, the people I trust don't like Stacey Abrams. You know, she's a Harvard technocrat, uh, only left of center. Not, yeah. not all in on Medicare for all. That's the purity test. She doesn't pass my purity test, but she's a winner yes. and a fighter. Who do we? Who do we have on the left? We have Bernie. Who's a winner? Yeah. Cory Bush is a winner. She is. I think AOC is a winner. I do too. Um, but we're going to find that out for sure. Since she on one of the Sunday shows specifically said, I'm going to vote against this bipartisan bill unless I get an agreement. She, she was focused on the three and a half trillion dollars. She said, I want to vote on that. What I'm saying is give a vote on that. Plus, make sure that Manchin and Cinema vote for a good voting rights bill. And if you and if you need a few more Republicans, you're probably not going to get them, but at least put the thing up to a vote and force all the Democrats to come up and vote for something that's yeah. meaningful. Yeah, I, I saw one of uh, Obama's henchmen, Pluff, David Pluff, David Pluff, tweet. Uh, 2022 is going to be the most important election in our <laughs> time to the DNC. And 
I thought, boy, you know, I've had a lot of important, I've had a lot of most important elections of my lifetime. Uh, it wouldn't be the most important election of our lifetime if Schumer and Biden and Pelosi would just plow through massive, massive programs through reconciliation and just you decide you want to blame exactly. inflation on us america go ahead now you have health care and we're fighting climate change T talk to me about inflation yeah we don't care uh, that's a good idea um of course the senate parliamentarian would probably go back to the old rules you can only use reconciliation i, I think it's twice in a in a congress but just so do it anyway. parliamentary parliamentarian yeah. and make new rules which is what mcconnell yeah. would do of course yeah. he would in fact i don't even know why they don't just ignore the rules as they exist now and just announce you t take something that's popular like uh, i mean a almost anything that's going to get even all the democrats to support it take a vote announce that you've passed it and let the house pass it and send it to biden i don't even understand where i've, I've looked into this in the, over the last week and i can't find an answer are rules as they're being interpreted by the house and the senate are they even justiciable in other words can could mcconnell say you violated the rules i'm going into court to demand that this be nullified i'm not even sure he has the power to do that if he did have the power to do that then why in the hell when uh amy coney bryant was being considered for the supreme court the Democrats, as you remember, I'm sure, literally refused to show up at the Judiciary Committee to pass, to even vote on the subject. The rule in the Judiciary Committee of the Senate was that you had to have at least one member of the minority party present to conduct any business. And the Democrats didn't show up. And Lindsey Graham said, I don't care what the rules are, we're voting her out. Now, nobody said, well, we should go to court over that because I'm not sure Supreme you can court. go to Supreme. I don't even know you can go to court. Take it to our over. Supreme Court. Take it to our Supreme Court before she gets on. <laughs> no, but I mean, for crying out loud, just do something dramatic. You know, back in the old days of regular filibusters, when when we were using them for some peacenik stuff and other things, um, I love the fact that that these members are going to have to come and have a discussion right on the floor as long as they could keep a quorum. And then you'd have a quorum call and they would drag other senators in. And people said, well, that would look so bad. And I said, that's the point. You go, you watch it on C-SPAN and, and, and people go, what the hell are these people doing? Well, they're not even talking about the candidacy. Uh, they're not talking about the credentials. If it's a court nominee, just just talk, force them to talk, force them to show that they don't know much of anything. The, these people that are currently Republicans, particularly in the Senate, well, the, the House, they're really ignorant. I mean, these are the stupidest collection of people I have ever come across. I've been working in Washington since 1974, and I have never seen people as dumb as these people. And I'm not just talking about, you know, the uh, uh, Bobert and and Gosar uh, and Gomer, Gosar and Marjorie Gomer. Taylor Greene. Yeah, I'm not You're talking, about, talking about the Josh Hawley's, the graduates of Absolutely. Yale School and Ted Cruz, Harvard Law School. They're, they're yeah. ignorant. They are. They truly are ignorant. And ignorant means in their case, they don't bother to do much research. And if if they do any research, they they don't want to sound like they know anything. So they um, they act like they never read a book unless it was a Dr. Seuss book in the case of Ted Cruz. Yeah, I have two impulses that I've been wrestling with, Reverend. Yep. Maybe yep. you can help me. Okay. The, the origin of the word Senate 
comes from senescence, from senile, old. That the 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 the, the elders. The herbs, yes. 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 You know, you, the Senate, the Roman Senate, was supposed to be the elder statesman saying, "Calm down." And that's the genius of our democracy. Supposedly, the idea is the Senate would be the older people, and the and the House of Representatives would be where the firebrands are, where there is a revolution in America every two years. They bake that in. It's a beautiful idea that there would be a revolution in America uh, in the House of Representatives every two years. And, and people say, why haven't they ever overthrown this government? Well, it happens every two years. It's supposed to happen every two years in the people's house. And then you have the Senate that kind of cools things down a little. That's the, the supposed genius. Right. Of. So as a as someone who believes in checks and balances and I'm older, <laughs> And I've gone through seasons of my life where I've been angry and I wanted to destroy things and then I've wanted to build things and I've seen I'm trying to build something and they're trying to destroy it. That we all have this, we're conflicted. There, we're, there are multitudes inside of all of us. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that, a, a man of many multitudes, or Whitman, Slim Whitman, I think, said it. I think Whitman, but I'm not sure. Okay. Slim Whitman. So, uh, or uh, the guy from Mad Men. Uh, that was also. <laughs> was You're talking about Walt Whitman. You said Slim Whitman. Oh, who, who's Walt that? Whitman? Uh, he's a poet. He played for the Knicks? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, he, so uh, I recognize yeah. all this stuff inside of me. Yeah. And all of us. Sure. And there's this part of me that says, you know, Medicare for all. The house is on fire. The problem is uh, my house isn't on fire. Hmm. And we're not hearing enough from people whose houses are on fire. That is the problem. We do not. And I and I'm guilty of it here. I should be having people on the show whose houses are on fire. Yep. And you know what I think? Kind of a downer. <laughs> I'm being honest. Of course. It, and, and it's shameful. No, it's you know, I should go be I should be talking to the homeless. Yeah. Well. Yeah. I should be having homeless people on the show and asking them uh, I'm just thinking well well you, you you know you could do a special and you could have six or seven homeless people just from New York City talk to you or you could go out and interview them on the street where they're laying down trying to get a, a nap and talk to them that way and then edit it not much maybe but just edit it and put it on and call it the david feldman homeless special right but we would they would just help me with my problems and and, and i'd say to them uh well you know there's a process that you need to understand and we need civility. I'm joking. Yeah. Um, you have Obama, $12 million state on Martha's Vineyard. Yep. Yep. And he and his friends are saying, or you have mansion on the boat, yep. almost heaven. You know, where you have rules and it's all about civility. And, and Jeff Bezos, when he lands, when his rocket ship lands, he, he says, uh, he, here's a million dollars to promote civility in America. Did you see that? Yeah, so that was he'll... right after he thanked all of the, the workers um, who he mistreats and all of the people who buy stuff for contributing to his rocket launch. I mean, yeah. that was literally the most tone deaf thing I've heard in years coming out of the mouth of anybody. He's got employees pissing into empty Gatorade bottles and he's talking about civility. Civility is used as a form of control. The, the Senate rules are about civility. 
and here's my thing that I that because I'm older uh, I see speech is given in the House of Representatives by the Republicans who lack civility and there's a part of me that thinks look what happened at the in, the insur- uh, this thing without civility without these rules w- we could become Syria right Oh, or, or we just could become a better country. You, you know, like fact, I but, the, serious. But, but, the, but the hypocrisy thing, you know, this endless book I'm I'm writing. Um, I was doing a section writing about my encounters with Ralph Reed, who, of course, formed the Christian coalition out of the Pat Robertson for president mailing list. That That's like the easiest way you want to create a, a new organization. You get the politicians mailing list that's closest to your ideology and you run with it. You, you're given it. You use it. He wrote a book. And he was a lobbyist for Indian casinos. Yeah. And for Enron. Enron like, and like Indian Jesus, casinos. Jesus what? would want you to uh, lobby for Enron and Indian casinos, correct? And misleading. Well, Didn't he almost go to prison in the Jack Abramoff scandal? Yes, he, well, I don't know if he almost went to prison, but he was high, He's to this day highly sensitive about it. But he wrote a book. Uh, in the middle of the time, I, I knew him well, and uh, he called for civility and uh, he, he complained about Jerry Falwell uh, using language that was bad. And, and uh, uh, T- Randall Terry, the big anti-abortion guy, um, that he used rhetoric that was too harsh and it was not going to get him anywhere. Meanwhile, his own organization, the Christian Coalition, had something on its website called a bookstore. And one of the books that was being sold at exactly the same time that Ralph was talking about civility was a book called Legislating Immorality. It was written by a guy who advocated that after trial, after trial, all gay people should be in jail and then also said and in some countries of course homosexuals are executed like maybe we should do that so you you see ralph reed here saying let's be civil and then selling in his own organization's bookstore a book that says gay people should be executed in america okay so civility so civility prevents people from saying what they really think Yes, it does. I mean, you could, but, but remember, you can say things that are harsh. You can say things that are real and you can you can do it without literally using the worst possible, the most revolting language to describe your opponents. I mean, you, you can be tough without being so disreputable that it comes back to haunt you. I mean, it's it's like Nina Turner's uh, S S H I T comment. Why why was it said? It came back to haunt her. I don't think that was the main reason she lost, but it was the kind of thing where she should have just like defund the police. She should have thought a little more about what it was, what she was going to say, how to describe it and then move on with making the argument. She didn't vote for Hillary in 2016. Right. In Ohio, was it Ohio? I think she lived in Ohio at the time. Was it? I mean, you know, I, I don't blame people for, I don't know who she did vote for. Did she vote for a third party? I don't know. I just don't know. But not to vote for Hillary in 2016 in ohio yep uh now i again i wanted nina turner to win sure and that does signal to people who don't pass our purity test there are you know not everybody thinks the way we do and we need their support and their vote there are a lot of Americans, a lot of Democrats, a lot of left left of center yep. people who we might think they're full of shit, but we need their votes. Yep. 
And there are a lot of people, whether you like it or not, who have a problem uh, with people who didn't vote for Hillary in 2016. Now, whether now you can argue with them, you're not going to win. Right, right. You got to get their vote. Of course. Of course. And it, it, you know, even I, who no fan of Hillary, 2016, you live in Ohio and you know what what Trump is capable of doing. I don't know. You hold your nose and vote for Hillary. A lot of people believe that a lot of Bernie sure. supporters, including Bernie, believe that. No, of course. Uh, I mean, argue with me, <laughs> tell me I'm wrong. Fine. You got to win my vote. Of course. And of course. So, you know, I don't know. It's um, I do think that um, it's the same issue. And, you know, Ralph Nader much better than I do. But I, I've talked to Ralph over the years about this. I mean, I do not think he, he cost Al Gore. I appreciate that. <laughs> he respects um, you. <laughs> I know, but he respects you. But, but um, I don't think he cost Al Gore the election. Of course not. No. And uh, but a lot of people do when they've, they've never forgiven him for for running and all of that. But um Here's the uh, thing about lying. And again, when you bring up Ralph Nader, uh, he did. Uh, Gore won Florida. They uh, the Miami Herald and, the, sure. and a Florida news consortium got all the votes together and added them up. Unfortunately, it was after 9-11. Yes. And they concluded that had Al Gore asked for all the votes to be counted right. in Florida, he would have won by a sizable margin. The problem is Al Gore is a Harvard technocrat, mm -hmm. and he thought he was going to outsmart the Bushes. So he only asked for recounts selectively in the counties where he thought he was going to win in right. Florida because he's an asshole. And he's too smart by half. And he, he looked, he goes, this Rube, George W. Bush, yeah. I can beat him. I'm just going to ask for a recount yep. in West Palm Beach, in, in these districts. Yep. Had he just been moral, which he isn't, and said, count all the votes, yep. he would have won. I think that's true. And I've seen that study. And I think that that's true. Um, you know, I was um, too smart by half. I just, I was in West Palm Beach the day after the election to speak you were to part a of the Bush Brothers riot, right? You were paying. Yeah, I was there. I was yeah. wearing a suit at the time, uh -huh. uh, but not from Brooks Brothers because oh. it's too expensive. But um, no, and I, I was down there to speak to a big Jewish group, big dinner they were having, and of course that was a county that where a lot of people had voted, ended up voting for Pat Buchanan because of the butterfly ballot, this goofy thing that, and I was at a table with maybe nine people and four or five of them admitted that they had probably voted for Buchanan because they didn't think they could ask for a new ballot to try it again. One guy said, well, I voted for, I ended up voting for Buchanan, and I, but I asked him for a new ballot and they gave it to me. So I got up to speak at the end of the day, right before uh, my substantive comments. And I thanked everybody down there for being such great environmentalists, because I said, you know, there's a tendency, you, you, you put up signs for the candidates you want to see, and then they stay up and they're all there. And I said, driving uh, from the airport to here, um, I was just amazed, you know, Pat Buchanan got so many votes here and all of his signs are gone. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, well, you um, know, uh, I don't know if you know <laughs> this, but I'm Jewish. Did you know that? Yeah, I did. Oh, I didn't okay. know that. Yeah. yeah. Most people don't know that. No, I don't uh, know. That. And I know some of the people <laughs> who voted <laughs> accidentally for Buchanan. Yep. Uh, they're no longer with us uh, in 20 some odd years. But a lot of them said, Ralph, that Ralph Nader, that Ralph Nader, who'd you vote for? I accidentally voted, voted for Matthew for Cannon. Yeah, it's Ralph Nader's yeah. fault that you're an effing moron. 
<laughs> that you can't you're you're 70 years old and you can't read a ballot and it's ralph nader's fault that you're a moron yeah. the people of the book <laughs> you're supposedly literate and you can't read an effing ballot and you vote for pat buchanan who was <laughs> defending Demunyuk, yeah. who's a borderline Holocaust denier, yeah. and you, of all people, accidentally <laughs> voted for Pat Buchanan, who says we should have never gone in to World for War II to save the Jews from the Nazis, and you <laughs> voted accidentally for <laughs> Pat Buchanan, and you're blaming Ralph Nader? <laughs> you effing moron. That's what I told some relatives. And you know what? Is that why they're Whoops. not here anymore? That's what, no. you know what they said to me after what, I yelled at them and screamed? What did they say? They said, you know what, David? You're absolutely <laughs> right. I didn't, th I never thought of it that way. I'm yeah. wrong. Yeah, yeah. right. Like, yeah. A, like anybody ever admits they're, they're wrong. No, no. Very few people do. But it was nice uh, telling you that. <laughs> Hey, can I tell you one thing yes, that makes me happy? Uh, okay, I've, I've become obsessed with Ron DeSantis and, and with people uh, uh, driving up to Massachusetts, turning on the radio every time we weren't listening to music. And um, because my car is one of the last cars, actually has a CD player. So we listen to a lot of music. But we turn wow. and I would listen to, to Fox. Of deposit, right? Yeah, that's what they are. A certificate it's like a, a 45, which is a kind of handgun. Yeah. Um, I couldn't believe the number of people. I, as I, I couldn't believe okay. the number of people who were being interviewed on Fox and even on MSNBC talking about how they're great patriots. And the sign that they're great patriots is that they will not get vaccinated just because somebody tells them to get vaccinated. And so I put a thing up on Facebook, which I usually don't put much of great importance up there. But I, I, I said, if you if you want to say I'm not getting vaccinated because you talk to a real doctor that you you've known and the doctor says, well, your unique medical conditions make me a little concerned about you being vaccinated. If you're not in that category, if you think that there's any other reason I want to show Joe Biden that he's that he can't do his job, I think they're putting DNA alterations in the vaccine. If you believe any of that crap, you, you can never, ever call yourself a patriot because you hate the country. And more importantly, you hate the people who live here and you're willing to put their lives at risk because of your unwillingness to get vaccinated. I just have no. And even the conservative people that generally respond on my Facebook page, they haven't said anything. It's been up for a day at least. They don't they don't. Nobody even argues with it, not because they don't want to argue, but because they I think at some level they know they're not patriots just because they refuse to get vaccinated. Right. Right. And don't get me started on if you say you're pro-life, but you're willing to send little kids back to school without a mask mandate because you have, as some woman on uh, uh, Laura Ingram's show last week said, she said, my little girl was suffering more last year having to wear a mask than than and then she didn't have anything to compare it to because it's obviously stupid. Nobody I know I've talked to so many people who have little kids in schools and you say, well, what do they say about masks? And they go, nothing. I mean, everybody's wearing the mask. Kids are really malleable, not because they see other kids wearing a mask. They don't get upset and unless they listen to their crazy parents they know that this is something that's going to protect them and it's going to protect other people they come in contact with so don't tell me you're pro-life if you want your kids to go back unvaccinated and unmasked to schools so what does desantis do desantis now is one percentage point behind charlie crisp who used to be a republican and was the governor of florida now he's a democrat and, and he's beating 
Yeah, he was a congressman, and but now he's one percentage point ahead. And what this, I think, indicates, this is why the good news, I, I try to always end on one positive note. I do believe there are people who are nominally Republicans who look at somebody like DeSantis and say, you know, this guy is so far off the deep end, I can't bring myself to vote for him again. Yeah. And I think there are other there are other Republican politicians in the same boat. And I think Asa Hutchinson, who, of course, is governor of Arkansas now, uh, he, he just the other day said, you know, I, I made a mistake signing that bill that prohibited any mask mandates anywhere in the state. He said, I, I, I may have acted prematurely, which means I think, because he is a good politician, not a good person, but a good politician, that he knows that there's a backlash. As you see these rates climb, we now have one third, I think, of all the new COVID cases are in Florida alone. People just look at DeSantis and say, he talked the tough line, but did he do us any good as Floridians or did he just put our lives at greater risk? And I think they're going to say, I think he put us at greater risk. I'm not going to vote for him again. He he literally said to Joe Biden, stay out of Florida. Yeah. Fix the border, the board, everything, yeah. every everything that's wrong <laughs> yep. in our country is the wall. We yep. need to build. the wall. He said, you brought covid into America, President, by by not fixing the border it's it's these mexicans and guatemalans who are bringing covid into america uh that's what he's saying you know you think, how can anybody be that evil no no it is evil it is evil that's my favorite word it's evil and uh i mean i i thought for a moment when he said that he might actually think that there was a border wall between florida and mexico but i i don't think he's that stupid I want to give uh, Emil Guillermo is joining us. And yeah. thank you, Reverend Barry W. I, I, before you go. Yes. yes. I want to go over some stats here. All right. Uh, from the top of the show. OK. OK. And and the, the evil lie that we hear on Fox News and some from left from some leftists who poo poo the January 6 insurrection. I am hearing from everybody on the right and some on the left that, yes, January 6 was bad, but, you know, the, the BLM marches were very violent as well. We have been lied to so much about last summer. And it comes at us so quickly that we can't disaggregate what the truth is. We, we just remember images from television. Sure. And so if somebody says with a bow tie, if Tucker Carlson says last summer was equally as violent, if not more so, the BLM was just as violent as the insurrection. And you hear some lefties saying that. Uh, that's a lie. And I, you got to lie. You got to correct the lie. Uh, now, the Reverend Barry W. Lynn celebrated his 50th wedding anniversary at a BLM march. Right. right. Um, so here, here's some interesting uh, facts. What was the death toll from last summer? I do not know the answer to that. But, but we're told on am talk radio on fox on newsmax and from some leftists on this show that it was a very violent summer well here are the facts according to the washington post three black lives matter protesters were killed last summer yeah, yeah. Hmm. two of those blm protesters who were killed were killed by kyle rittenhouse in Wisconsin, Kyle Rittenhouse, a right winger, he was about 17 at the time, showed up with some assault weapons, was talking to the cops. And after he 
fired the shots and killed two BLM protesters. He was treated pretty much the same way the cops treated Dylan Roof, who shot up the uh, South Carolina Carolina church. Yes. And there is a legal defense fund that the Republicans set up for Kyle Rittenhouse after he killed two BLM protesters. Okay. Yep. Uh, The other death associated with Black Lives Matter last year was a Antifa who's not BLM. Antifa showed up in Oregon, in Portland, Oregon, and we are told that an, a member of Antifa, not BLM, killed a member of a far right group in Portland, Oregon. Now, we don't really know what went down and we're never going to find out because when this alleged member of Antifa killed an alleged member of a far right group in Portland, Oregon, the police tracked this alleged Antifa man down and killed him, shot him to death under very questionable circumstances. You know, we get so much coming over the transom. Sure. There were several newspapers that recreated the moments leading up to the shooting, the police shooting of this alleged Antifa member. And it's questionable as to why the cops had to shoot him. Uh, But let's give Antifa one. Let's give them one killing. All right. For the entire summer. Yep. Okay. That wasn't Black Lives Matter. That was Antifa. Uh, Hardly a tsunami of violence. Well, what about the cops? Because I hear, you know, January 6th, we we just had two more suicides this week. Correct. Capitol Police officers who went through that ordeal two more just committed suicide. Uh, And if you bother to watch the videos that the New Yorker prepared or the New York Times prepared or uh, the Capitol Hill uh, Select Committee on the riots prepared, if you bother to watch it, you can understand why cops who were involved committed suicide. Uh, It was abhorrent. And by the way, more cops are likely to die from suicide than anything else. But that's a whole other issue. So how many cops were killed last summer uh, by protesters? One. One cop. Very tragic. Yep. And uh, the cop was killed in California, shot not by BLM, not by Antifa, shot by someone who's part of the Boogaloo movement, not BLM. The Boogaloos, those are right wing. Those are like far right. You know, they're like in Tucker Carlson territory. Correct. Correct. Uh, So BLM, there were no deaths because of the BLM protesters. Zero. None. There was a little property damage Mm -hmm. that they cannot prove was linked to BLM. Yes, there were a couple of cop cars that caught fire. Was that BLM? It wasn't sanctioned by BLM. Was it uh, agent provocateurs who pretended to be part of BLM? Gee, that's never happened in America (laughs) where people on the right infiltrate a left wing movement and create some kind of as Alex Jones likes to say, false flag. Uh, The precinct that burnt down in Minnesota, Derek Chauvin's precinct that got burnt down, that wasn't BLM. That was a white guy who did that. And many say he was an agent provocateur. It is a lie to say the George Floyd protesters were violent. It was peaceful. Now, television, television only covers violence. Of course. So you associate a large protest and then see a police car on fire. You're going to see a mob of people 
and a police car on fire and your brain is going to associate the mob with that police car on fire. Two separate things. That's why, and I said this at the top of the show, if you only get your news from television, and that includes CNN, MSNBC, you're ignorant. You cannot help but be ignorant. There is no way for you to disentangle what happened last summer by watching the news, because the news will only show you violence. They will not show you there were 7,500 protests last summer. You will not, late breaking news here on CNN, this protest in Santa Monica has gone on for six hours. Not a single tear gas pellet has been fired. Oh, honey, I gotta watch this, hang on. Exactly. There's a peaceful protest in Santa Monica. Of course. You get your news from TV, I'm sorry, you're ignorant. They don't disentangle this miasma of information that's coming at you and you're susceptible to lies coming to you from the right who want you to believe that BLM is violent because the right is terrified of Gandhi, John L. Lewis, and Martin Luther King, which BLM is rooted in. They're terrified of nonviolent resistance. So they have to gin up the mirage of violence. The fact is the, the only violence was committed by right-wing agitators and the police. Yes. The police turned these protests into slow boil police riots. There are hundreds of videos that have been compiled of police officers abusing protesters, finding the, the right moment to take it out on a protester. Correct. Uh, the Washington Post has a piece that came out last autumn they studied all the protests and this article in the Washington Post concluded that when the police showed up to a protest, there was violence, not because the protesters got violent. It's because the cops got violent. That's a fact. Anybody who tries to equate what happened to the uh, Capitol Police on January 6 and equates it to the summer of pr peaceful protests last summer and says the BLM marchers were violent. Uh, I accuse you of being ignorant and I accuse you of being a racist, which is synonymous. Yes, yes, it is. They were they were peaceful protests. Yep. And anybody who says otherwise is an ignorant racist. And that's a fact. Do the math. And, and I'm sick of this lie getting uh, spread that last summer was violent. The only cop who died was killed by a member of the Boogaloos. God damn it. I, I, I just... The, 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 how, how, how do they allow lies like this to, to get spread? It's because so they repeat it every day. Yeah. Because they repeat it, that's the great propaganda tool of the big lie. If you say it enough times, it starts to seep into coverage in more mainstream publications and then people start to believe it because I, I, anyway, I didn't just hear it on Fox and I didn't just see it on the Drudge Report. I think I saw it, it was in, way down in the, toward the end of a Washington Post piece. It's, it's the same mythology. People, I don't know what is wrong with the way journalism is taught these days. But when I think of all these great journalists that I knew and was in constant contact with in the 70s and 80s and 90s, and I look at the people now who are just 
they just seem to report based on unnamed sources somewhere that said this or they speculate that they meant that this is not in my judgment good journalism it's why i don't particularly uh, fall over backwards to buy all of these tell-all books about the last year the trump administration because they all rely on sources that are not mentioned and i'd be interested in what emil thinks about this but i i find it hard I'd like to believe all these scandalous things that are being said in the three or four latest books, but I'm just not as ready to believe them as if it said, Joe Schmo told me he was in the room with Donald Trump and Donald Trump did whatever outrageous thing it was. I'm curious, Emil, because Emil, I mean, uh, Emil, very, yeah. yeah. This is a tough one. Look, journalism has gone through a change. They're they're going for audience. They, they've always gone for audience, but they're sure. even going for it now more than ever. I think that I, you know, the the books that are have been out about the last year. You turn I, your volume. You have to turn your volume down. Okay. Not because it's too loud, but you're part of a marginalized group. <laughs> Are, Sorry about that. Reverend Barry W. Lynn gets the highest decibel. I get the second <laughs> highest. Base, this is just the second order here in America. I know so how to. I was, I was a talk show host. I know how to take people down and like they're talking on to the, you know, the, the phone, and I've got them off mic. You know, so, look, <laughs> that's an old talk show host trick. Right? Sure. Right. So anyway, look, uh, Barry. I be, I want to believe some of those books, even Michael Wolf's books. He had yeah. access. He was there. He can write about it. He doesn't want to get sued. Unnamed sources, anonymous sources is a kind of a it's a it's a technique, right? It's Woodward a and Bernstein yeah. invented it. Pardon me? Oh, yeah. Woodward, Woodward and Bernstein, Bernstein, they, didn't, kind of they didn't invent it, but the, it, they were enabled yeah, by it. it. They were enabled by it. And it works as long as in journalism and i've taught it before in college you got to tell your editor who someone knows who the unnamed sure. source is and that's why it's still a good technique because it gives people the anonymity to tell the truth we all want to get at the truth right yeah it's so hard to get so you give someone anonymity they tell the truth boom you got something according to this unnamed source or according to people in the know yeah that's that that's how it works yes. and so i want to trust those books but you're right there's so many people who are liars and lying has become so commonplace it is so hard and we're, we're you know you've heard this complaint we're so siloed everyone just gets their yeah. single source it's like a reporter shouldn't go to a single source and then do a news story but audiences go to a single source and say i know it because they <laughs> trust they trust that the reporter has gone to more than one source which true sometimes they haven't right it's sometimes yeah. it's the battle of the pr folks right? well i mean if you're judith miller and dick cheney is telling you their weapons of mass destruction well, look, what more uh, do you need to know <laughs> that that's been one of the look, I love that. I love and hate the New York Times. It is the paper of record, but it screws up big time. One of the biggest screw ups in the last 20 years was the Wen Ho Lee case and the Wen Ho Lee, the nuclear scientist who was accused of being a spy. Anyone who remembers the 80s and 90s remembers Wen Ho Lee. <laughs> and the thing about Wen Ho Lee, the criticism was, uh oh, we rely too much on the CIA. We rely too much on inside government sources. We did not humanize enough when holy. That was the New York Times mea culpa, and it was a big mea culpa front page sure. editorial. And I don't think many people remember it now. Only a couple of nerds will remember, <laughs> you know, when holy. But it is sort of like even the good guys screw up in journalism right yeah. and then yeah. you'll you look at what's his face oh god you know um the the guy who uh, took uh to, to, who took ellsberg to task and then he got in trouble himself oh his name escapes me uh, right now but the the thing is he was in on some of that when holy stuff or some other thing and, and then toward the end everyone in journalism was was trying to you know, butchers him when he was under attack. I, I, you know, the thing is, look, journalists are human. We do believe in the truth. 
And we're only trying to do as good a job as our organizations, our capitalist organizations so allow wow. us, which is why you have to believe the people who aren't making any money and the people who are doing it for nonprofits and the people mm -hmm. who are just doing it because this is what they do. Sure. So that's kind of, uh, you know, and, and, and if, if we can just cut down the silos, cut the silos down to size so that instead of these huge silos, that, you know, oh, conservatives say they, they read their, their source. If you cut it down into eighths or one hundredths, the silo wouldn't be as big and they'd have to go to other sources. Yeah. Diversity yeah. of sources will always improve uh, their, their, their mind. Maybe the Washington Post should give free free uh subscriptions right because you know if you if you expand the circulation you can give your paper away for free and say look Bezos doesn't have that kind of money <laughs> oh come on he's got he's got 63 miles worth of money, money. Ben, on a silo that goes to the edge of space you know but yeah but that's that's mm -hmm. I, as you guys were talking i was thinking we need an in real time truth detector that everyone can go to it, yeah. it too bad it's not google too bad it's not wikipedia but wouldn't it be nice if we had a truth agency that had conservatives and liberals and people who were uh yes sort of we have one. we have one which is what general not, i've been saying this for years we have a truth agency it's called the capital it's called the administrative state. It's called the GAO, the inspectors general. It's called the IRS. These are these are esteemed institutions that are bipartisan and deal with numbers. You know, the uh, the CBO, the Congressional Budget right. Office, G G o they score G a bill. Excuse me for one second. When the CBO scores a bill, they say it's the closest thing to God. And of course, the Republicans want dynamic scoring as opposed to the other type of scoring because they want to work the refs. But if you had uh, a news org, if C-SPAN, which, by the way, is not running advertising, uh on, on the web if you just took c-span and added a couple million dollars a year and had people repurpose the footage from c-span on the left and on the right you would have real truth detecting real journalism somebody just culling what is available on c-span and putting together a news organization and and you could have the left take their clips and the right could take the, the truth is all on c-span well the truth is a transcript by the yeah. way well the thing is that was always the gift of c-span right they just stuck the camera in the corner and played it and they just ran it and you can get you, you could be there and there was no it was totally objective it was machine right it was machine recording i've been theory. pulling clips off c-span for this show it's oh, great yeah. Oh yeah, I I love C-SPAN too, but uh, I, their their coverage is I mean, when they're there, they're, it's good. And sure. sometimes there are things that you you wouldn't expect them. And sometimes I don't know. They're not as all they're not always as accessible. I feel, but maybe after the fact. But I I agree. C-SPAN is good. We we need you know. I, someone said that they w Wikipedia isn't all that bad, although. You know, it's one silo, one short silo. If more people uh, accessed more silos, we'd be much better off. I would love to know who's handling my Wikipedia page. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, yeah. <laughs> like I read that, I go, really? Okay. Really? Can anybody write whatever they want? Pretty much. I I don't I don't know how it works, but I got a small Wikipedia page, but then I'm Asian American. So but uh, <laughs> I <laughs> but the, the thing is, I, I, I think people can put stuff in and then there's like, a, I don't know, maybe, maybe someone comes in and they, they check and verify or they'll, they'll say this is an un something or. Right. I, I don't know. I don't I it I know that it's hard to get a Wikipedia page. You need a PR person. Uh, sometimes or you need groups groups that have been identified as being underserved they they work together and they get stuff on wikipedia so i don't know 
The Reverend Barry yeah. W. Lynn, for nearly a quarter of a century, ran Americans United for Separation of Church and State. He is an attorney, a member of the Supreme Court Bar, and he is also an ordained minister in the United Church of Christ. We have him on every week. He's absolutely brilliant. And he, the possibility of his wife coming back <laughs> is in front of us. And we uh, enjoy your grandkids. I will do that. Don't let them turn your brain to mush. I don't even know they're they're trying to do that, but I'm going to be very, very careful. Sure We're thinking are. of taking, you know, I have very mixed feelings about zoos, but they've never been to a zoo. They have never seen a giraffe or an elephant in real life. They only see them in books. We're thinking of taking them to see a local oh. zoo here on this coming weekend. I'll They're report gonna back. I, 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 we're going to get a lot of complaints. Thank God we don't have any <laughs> who's who to pine on that. At least bring vegan snacks, Barry. Okay, I can see that. They, that was they, very <laughs> passive aggressive. That was, was literally a parting shot. I know, but I, I had to be honest. and I, But I really do have very, very mixed feelings about zoos around the world. But well, talk to the Filipinos who were in the zoos in 1905 at the World's Fair. You know, it's not a nice feeling to be pointed at. No, I don't think it I is. Know, I noticed it's not. I have a <laughs> question for Ann Lee, Professor Ann Lee. The origin of the word parting shot. I believe there was a there there were like uh, uh, there was like part. Parthenians or part they were they were like uh, on horses and they would fire their arrow. They would turn around and fire. They were known for firing arrows behind them. And it was originally called a parthing shot. I know <laughs> Professor Ann Lee would be able to answer this question. We're hello, Professor Adnan Hussein. We're running uh, a half hour behind because some someone can't keep his mouth shut. That's fine. I just wanted to <laughs> offer a Parthian shot. <laughs> what is the origin of the Parthian? What is it? Well, um, it's these nomadic um, warriors on horseback who would charge, fire arrows, and then wheel around before they actually engaged the enemy in direct sort of hand-to-hand -hand combat and as if retreating they would wheel around and then as you were saying turn and be able to fire effectively uh backwards while riding away and so the parthians were known for this but this is a feature of nomad step warrior military practices really perfected by the Mongols, which is partly why they were such devastating, you know, world conquerors is because they could do this kind of shooting from horseback. Um, so, yes, so that's the I think the origin uh, is the Parthian shot. But I would have to check. And that wasn't that. Ann Lee, by the way. That was Professor Adnan Hussain. <laughs> and that was well, I just I, I it's very <laughs> memorable to me because uh, at Berkeley as a student, as an undergraduate, I had um, John Mason Smith um, in the Department of History there, who was a Central Asia specialist, but his real love was the nomads of the steppes. And he was himself an equestrian. And so he would get very enthusiastic about demonstrating these steppe nomad uh, military practices, and he would jump up on the desk at the you know, his desk, you know, in the lecture hall and begin kind of like demonstrating, you know, oh, this is how they did it. And then he would demonstrate the Parthian mm -hmm. shot and so on. So it's very vivid in my mind because I had a real enthusiast who liked to enact and reenact Mongol military techniques. Wow. And, and no trigger warning. So he can't. <laughs> I'm sure. He, yeah, I'm sure he's, it was a different uh, time. I'm sorry, what? It was a different time. There a were no trigger time. warnings. Let me do this. That one of the this was so a blessing to be. Yes, it's not a floater. It's a fly. Uh, I have a fly. <laughs> okay. I keep thinking, OK, do I want it to be a floater or a fly? 
Thank you, Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Thank you. I'll see you I next week. I meal with the professors and Marianne because we always, we, we don't give a meal the time he deserves. A lot of the listeners have complained. Have they but, complained? Oh, yes. Bless their hearts. Bless yeah. their hearts. <laughs> so we're going to give you, we're running a little, beh- we're, maybe we're not running as far behind as I thought we were, but, uh, Okay, thank you, Reverend Barry W. Lynn. Thank you. It is an See honor. It really Bye-bye. Have Barry W. Lynn on Twitter. Follow the man on Twitter, please. And go to BarryWLynn.com. Stay out of trouble, Reverend. Only good trouble. Thank Bye-bye. Bye. I love saying that to a reverend. Stay out of trouble. <laughs>